I'd encourage you, um, well, first of all, let me congratulate you on winning the, the BCS prize, um, which I'm sure you deserve. And um, we're going to be quite interested to hear what you've done. Um, but I, I would encourage you to use your BCS membership. Uh, at the very least, look online and see what BCS can do for you uh, in terms of contacts, meetings that you might want to attend, mentors or people you might want to approach, because BCS can do a lot. Um, and I, I, and I, I hope it really, I hope that we can actually help you in your career. Uh, and none of this really applies to Meg, who is already very, uh, very much involved with BCS. Um, are you, are you ready to start your presentation, mate? Should we? Should yeah, we I can do mine. Um... Well, con congratulations on, on winning the prize, first of all. Thank you. Uh, you should be able to share as co-host. Yeah. Okay. I've had to share my screen a few times before and I've never done it particularly well, despite being a computer science student. So please bear with me. Um, okay. So should I go ahead and start? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so hi, my name is Meg. My project this year was um, towards fair and ethical AI. Wait, can you see my the people on the side? Should I get rid of that? I'll just get rid of them. You're, um, yeah, you're, you're all good. You can We can just see yeah. the presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the title of my dissertation was Towards Fair and Ethical AI, which was a critical analysis into the use of automated decision-making tools designed for criminal justice. Um, bit of a long title. I had changed it halfway through and realized I just copied the title of another paper I saw by accident. So yeah, got rid of that. Um, throughout my time at Sussex, I've always been interested in the implications of the software we make. And I've been interested in algorithmic bias and... AI ethics and how um, issues we have in the world like sexism and racism can come into the software that we make. Um, oh, so my project focused on a piece of software called Compass, which is used for used in the US for automated risk prediction. Um, so specifically when someone has been incarcerated and been in prison for a while, they will go up for parole and it will be decided whether they're released early or released at all. And um, when you're released from prison, you can either fall back into a life of criminal behavior, which is known as recidivism or not, like arrive at a state of non-offending, which is assistance. And Compass is a piece of software which predicts how likely someone is to um, fall back into recidivism. Um, the work that I did can be broken down into three stages, which were research, um, analysis and mitigation. And I started by looking at a lot of different forms of algorithmic bias and automated discrimination and where they can come from in general and where the compass algorithm shows evidence of them. This is the bias feedback loop I identified. It looked better in my presentation, but I took out the fancy um, automations because it used up a lot of time um, and basically uh, it shows how bias introduced at any point in the design to deployment um, cycle can just impact at the next point and so on and so on and um, I then found out where compass algorithm from the data they used and the prediction they make have evidence of different types of um, bias and here you can kind of see where different biases can come into the you know the cycle it's kind of hard to see and then I found that the compass algorithm made predictions with evidence of racial bias. Um, and this is where I went into doing extensive research into the correlates of crime and whether the bias in the predictions could be explained and they, it couldn't, you know, that's not surprising. Um, and then I moved on to analysis and I did a lot of exploratory data analysis because a lot of the um, bias we see comes from the data, but I was held back a bit because with GDPR and the ethical approval, I couldn't get access to all of the data they use, which, and also they don't, you know, say exactly what the algorithm does. And they're very, very secretive about what's taken in and how they come to these decisions. Um, 
But then what I did is I looked at the predictions it had produced and how many were like true positive predictions. So predicted someone would um, reoffend and they did and how many were false positives. And what I found oh, is that um, I found this in my analysis and all the research I did is that risk was overpredicted in black individuals and underpredicted in white individuals. And it's quite important that two, those two were happening at the same time because then when you look at individual case studies, you'll see someone who has a really long arrest record and you know, multiple counts of felony crimes who has been released and someone who has maybe one or two misdemeanors that's been kept in prison. And the only thing that differentiates them is their race. And there's no way to statistically or like in any way back up the results that have come from the algorithm. Um, the next thing I did is I implemented seven different bias mitigation techniques and I had an initial logistic regression and a random forest classifier um, model to compare how using bias mitigation techniques can increase fairness but also keep a high accuracy and um, what that kind of like showed was is me who was a third year computer science student who has um, a pretty crappy laptop and you know of, you know, I started I mean, programming like five years ago, if I can make fairer predictions from the limited data that they use, why can't companies be making fairer predictions and why can't they implement bias mitigation techniques when they have teams of like thousands? But yeah. Um, and there are lots of different ways of like mitigating algorithmic bias. And the final part of my project was making a framework for moving towards ethical and explainable AI, the title. and. Um, this covered things like how bias can be detected and mitigated. And this is just like some small solutions I outlined, um, including like the data, because we need representative data sets. What I found is that um, in the data, they had had something ridiculous, like 200 um, samples for Native American people. And it's like, well, the algorithm's not going to learn, you know, a good enough trend among like that racial group because any anomaly is just going to be heightened and we just need to be representing groups you know the way that they exist in the world um and then i kind of talked about how we can very easily implement bias mitigation techniques like so many of them exist already it's not that places have to do it themselves um and we can a lot of places you know they'll use sensitive features like race or gender religion and age and i understand that that does have to be used but what i looked at like different ways that these can be used and it's just not you know i've not seen any company that uses these and has been found to have discrimination be able to kind of justify the use of them um i also think that it's really important that we start measuring fairness as well as accuracy because if we're just optimizing an algorithm in terms of accuracy, all these things are going to fall through the cracks. And often we find that when we only look at accuracy, we ignore, you know, all the other errors that we can see. And then finally, I looked at how um, we could take legal steps towards regulating algorithms and AI. And, you know, this starts with like the easy things like increasing diversity in the tech workforce, which is currently, you know, like 79% white and 75% male. And, unfortunately you know you can track where companies have a lack of diversity to the mistakes they've made in software and then like the more challenging things like asking companies to be transparent with their algorithms which they will not do because they don't want to um and then that's basically what i did in my project and this is just a list of like the books i read which relate to um, algorithmic bias and ai ethics and inequality in computing and the dangers of data which i would recommend because they are really interesting and I like them and yeah I can answer questions or go into more detail I just don't want to um, go over the time limit so. uh, thanks Meg uh, does anybody have any quick questions I'll raise one if I might Blay. I mean actually, I think this, this is actually quite an interesting and ambitious uh, kind of project it's, it's really quite a an interesting area this this whole area of of regulation of algorithms, uh, which is quite a sort of a, a hot topic in the media. Um, it occurs to me that socioeconomic status isn't one of the descriptors that you were looking at. And um, certainly from a, a crime and, and policing kind of perspective, 
there is a body of thought, not universally shared by people, that that has got a very strong relationship with many types of low level crime, and in particular with things like gang membership, which is one of those kind of factors which can grossly distort the kind of statistics that you were looking at. Yeah, so I chose to look at race because I was not, so there are 402 attributes that the algorithm takes about a person. I was given access to six. Um, so I was quite limited with what I could choose to analyze. And I wanted to use, I was gonna use, a, I wanted to use um, like education level and look at all the different factors, but I had, race, sex, gender, um, age, and then just like prior crimes committed. And the gender, like I didn't have enough data because there were like hardly any cases for women. And um, what I looked at in my research is because when you Google, you know, like who's more likely to commit crimes, you'll get all that data that says, well, there are less white people in prison. And that's why, you know, white people are less likely to make cri commit crimes. And that's why I had to do a lot of in-depth research because I know, you know, why there are less white people in prison um, and the longest studies on recidivism and crime always show that the key correlates of crime are you know poverty levels education levels and where you are in the world and whether like when you're coming out of prison you've got a support system and those often overlap with race um, which and that all you know makes it harder to do to like critique these algorithms because I read um, so the company that produced Compass is called Equivent, and I re read their report where, you know, they refuted all the claims against their algorithm. And they said, well, look at the statistics. And it was like, but you have to, you know, think a bit deeper than just these numbers. You have to like take in the context. And that's where I think regulation gets a bit difficult because you can back up a lot of things with data, even when they're not. Hmm. You know, did the company right. did the company who made the software have they actually seen your report or did it have anything to say on on, oh. on the conclusions that you reached mine no but another company did um the same sort of research and they um, did it in america so they had um, a lot better access to the data and they published their claims they're called propublica and um equivalent came back and said like you you're wrong our software's good. It's 66% accurate. And I was like, hold on, that's, you know, that's not good enough. Even if we're not talking about, you know, um, disparities in racial groups, that's one in three people have a wrong outcome. And when you're using this to keep, you know, at the worst case, you've got maybe someone kept in prison a month longer than they should have been, but that's still pretty bad. And you're releasing people who maybe, it's hard to talk about this because I am, you know, like, for prison abolition but you're releasing people who should be in prison and you're letting people out who shouldn't have been let out and I know that the decision by this isn't taken as like 100% fact but it is used in the jury and the bail decisions and I just feel like that's not good enough accuracy because okay interesting 66% hmm. yeah. Yeah. and I actually got higher than they did and I'm like, you know, one person and I'm not a company. So I kind of think you're just out here and you were improved upon by like a 23 year old. And I increased the fairness and like equalized the accuracy rates between races. So like my whole thing with the legality and like, this is just why aren't you taking more steps to be better? So what is your belief for how systems like this should be regulated? Good question. Um, so I think that we should have external bodies that check software because a fun fact I found out is that of the five validity studies of Compass, three happened to be authored by someone who made the software, but under like, you know, not the name Compass, it was like a guy called Jeff. And I was like, I know your name. And I was thinking, well, you know, I'm the best person to test my software because I know where I've badly programmed things and I know where the bugs will be. But when I'm talking about like the ethics, I probably wouldn't be because um, I can just say, no, it works. It works, look, it works. And we need like third parties to be testing these softwares when they're used to make, I will say life and death decisions. Cause it's not just this kind of application. We also have algorithms that determine whether people get loans, um, whether they're given the job and these are decisions that impact. And they the are similarly unregulated. You see clowns on television talking about their algorithms 
And it gave rise right to my favourite moment in question time once, actually, which is a lady who asked a, uh, a, a question of a Microsoft represent, representative on question time and said, when are you going to stop using algorithms? And the thing is, algorithms aren't the problem, because if you read my <laughs> dissertation, you might think I'm like anti-computers, but it's just that we need to be holding them to the same standards we'd hold a person, well, hopefully hold a person to. Um, you know, if I can't, if I am the hiring manager and I only hire blonde women, someone's going to be like, hold, hold on now. But, you know, when it comes from an algorithm, people are like, oh, but it has to be unbiased. And a computer made the decision. It's like, yeah, but someone told the computer, you know, how to make the decisions. And I just think we need a lot of these software, like it's new and we need just more regulation and we need more transparency. And I think that I should be able to like ask questions about why a company has made these decisions in this algorithm they made, but I can't because they have it kept. I, I see a career for somebody campaigning for the rights of individuals against automated decision-making. Good effort, good but project, actually, interesting. Can I sum up on all this by saying, so uh, we, we, I'm on the all-party parliamentary advisory group for AI, and I, I can therefore tell you that the government have noticed algorithmic bias, and, they, and they're going to take action, uh, watch this space. Uh, and developing my theme from earlier, I have over my career, on several occasions, known the government to take advice from BCS. In fact, on matters of computing, who else are they going to ask? So I would encourage you to use your membership of BCS to put some pressure to get, I mean, I think Meg's suggestion of independent auditing is absolutely brilliant. Um, and th that's, that should be a legal requirement. Uh, and I would encourage people to push for that because I've, I've noticed the government actually listened to BCS, not always, um, but BCS, BCS do have a voice in these matters. We, we have one quick question from the chat as well. Uh, I just okay. wanted to share. So um, Shofi Islam asks, uh, this is a really good project on the US system, um, but do you think there are similar concerns in the UK criminal justice system or in any other areas? Absolutely. Um, the only reason I chose America is because um, Florida, where the software is used, has open record laws. So I could look at people's criminal records, but that didn't actually work because we have GDPR and it you know, crosses borders. Um, but we like the UK system uses, so we have um, a lot of facial recognition software in the criminal system in the UK. And um, unsurprisingly, there's a lot of racial bias there where, you know, you can, there's a woman who did a study at MIT and she found that um, one of the principal facial recognition applications was 99% accurate in white men. And then when you drop down through the different groups, it then dropped to 67% accurate in black women. And they're using these softwares to, you know, find a criminal who's run away and you're getting the wrong people and you know even if that person doesn't end up going to jail when you get arrested you have a record for the rest of your life and that's the kind of thing UK people should be worried about with facial recognition we also have um I read an article about this algorithm that was being used to predict crime and it was going off you know crimes that had happened and it just ended up being racist again and all the problems that we have in the US, they are happening in the UK, but I just think, um, you know, we don't hear them reported about because every time I read an article, it just says like, oh, an algorithm made some mistakes and we're not getting back to the root problem, which is the programmers have programmed something bad. I don't know if that answers the question. Yep. Thanks, Meg. I'm going to have to give Will chance to uh, describe his project now. Are you ready to go, Will? Yeah, ready to rock and roll. Okay. Right, let me uh, start by sharing my screen. Okay, you see that all right? That's great. Perfect, all right. Uh, so this is Outmode. This is uh, my final year project. It was a Unity racing game. Um, it's, a, it's a project that kind of I've got inspired by um, through popular culture and science fiction, uh, particularly in the 80s, as you can probably tell from the style. It's, um, it's basically a, like a, a retro-futuristic look at um, the racing game genre. So I'm sure a lot of you will know back in the 80s, there were these um, you know, arcade cabinets. You had like these uh, racing games, you drive bikes and, and sports cars across America and stuff. The, the one in particular was uh, OutRun. 
uh, this is a direct um, direct response, a modern response to that game in a modern setting. Um, myself, I'm particularly invested in 1980s pop culture. So this has definitely, um, definitely inspired me. Um, I'm definitely driven passionately by this um, to, to include as a portfolio piece. And as a, it's, it's been a long time in development. So it's definitely helped me over the course of uh, God, uh, two years almost um, learning how to get something like this into a playable state. Uh, and then finally into the final year project form. Um, so it has a bunch of different unique quirks about the game. Um, some quick ones real quick. There's um, there's three pretty fledged game modes, the race, and there's some time trial. Uh, similar to the, again, similar to the 80s arcade cabinets, you could choose your different um, styles of mode. Um, there's split screen, so if you're playing mates, uh, absolutely fine. Um, and since this is uploaded to Steam, a distribution platform, uh, for PC gaming, uh, you can then share your your screen remotely. There's like a live stream, but then you can also intercept uh, your mate's input and uh, you can play together like that, uh, which I've found is very handy for lots of different players around the world. Um, I've created this, but I've tried to modernize again this whole theme of modernizing something into a, it's something modernizing a, a 1980s theme. Um, that with the technology behind it, so um, the the racing system of, of the game is like physicalized. It uses physical uh, vehicles to um, it's, it's it's more it's more realistic you know, basically, but it's still an arcade style um, game. Now, the aesthetic um, is particularly known in the community as Outrun or Synthwave, which is the actual music style behind it. It's very synthesizer based, synth wave wavy synth uh, synthesizers um, of the eighties, um, which is this whole kind of movement of this of this aesthetic. Um, I've tried to implement that uh, as best as I can into into the game. Uh, using you know mood boards over the years and again uh, something I'm personally very motiv motivated by I got the uh, Back to the Future poster there so um, I'm very again very uh, into this um, but the, I've, I've seen games over the years which have tried to emulate this kind of thing as you can see there's um, at the bottom there's OutDrive, PowerDrive 2000 and RetroWave they all did quite well apart from PowerDrive which never actually released that is the game I've basically tried to recreate because it was going to be huge on the market um, and there wasn't many people, um, there were, sorry, there were loads of people invested, but the developer abandoned the project in the end. So my, my kind of thinking was to combine all three of these different games because they've got all different kind of play styles. Um, they kind of fell short in areas which I thought could have, um, could have jumped up in and filled the gap in the market. So I use Unity, um, very simple to use uh, alongside learning C-sharp in my spare time. Um, it gives you amazing, um, amazing, you know, control, you can use physics and your programming is great and you can implement like audio systems perfectly. Um, there's a lot of documentation out online, YouTubers and influencers will help you out here and there. And, you know, it's, 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 it's like a perfect software to get into coming out of uni, um, into the industry. Um, I used for the marketing and stuff, I've used like Adobe packages, After Effects, Premiere um, to help put together trailers and stuff. Um, now there is a demo, um, of course, and the game has been released on Steam as of God, three weeks ago, and it's done just how about I thought it would do. Again, I don't have much experience as the first game for me in the market, um, but it's been very, very uh, valuable to me uh, learning about how, you know, especially as an indie dev, as solo over a course of years, it's like, it's perfect um, to learn about what I should do next um, and, you know, what can be done better, basically. Um, I like my code now, if I went back to it and, to rewrite it it would take ages because it's all just spaghettified but um it, it's been a, a fantastic experience um and i'm looking forward to put that knowledge to use basically in the future um so i'll show you um a trailer um on youtube and then i'll talk over it and then i'll try and show you some gameplay if we have some time so don't worry too much about the sound it's just the soundtrack um if you can't hear it but um this is this will give you an insight into what it looks like um, so try to, I, I modeled everything by hand using Blender. Um, all the, my cars have specialized interiors and, you know, animations on the characters controlling the wheel and stuff. That was all fun to do. Um, and it taught me again, a lot about the different skill sets you need to have, bring a game like this to life. Um, but in, in the end, it, is, it definitely took a lot of time. Um, and I think I did overshoot my scope quite a tremendous amount. Um, but I got there in the end, and that's all that matters. And I've got the experience behind me now and a degree. So again, that's all perfect going forward. Um, but basically, you can kind of tell it's like a racing game. So you jump in, you get your, you select a car, um, and then you just 
you just race along a track, um, a different styles of track. So as you can see, the, the aesthetic has enabled me to, to you know, go into outer space or like, you know, some mountainous landscape or whatever. It's, it's, it's amazing. The freedom that, um, you know, having all these skills gives you is just amazing. You know, you can create worlds, build literal worlds um, and, you know, put your projects in there and, and get it on the market, which is the best thing because people give you, you know, feedback and the amount of feedback I've received from, from lots of people has is, is been great. You know, um, the game wouldn't have been anything like it is now without them. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the, the skills um, wouldn't have been very valuable without this feedback. And some of it was critical, of course, and that is actually very valuable. I think it's best to not take that on the nose and just don't, don't take it personally because obviously you know, it's first game and you're not going to do as well um, as like, you know, the latest AAA title. Um, but it's still, at the end of the day, it's still good and you can learn. It's just the best part of it, I think, honestly. I never expected that, but that was the the best kind of way to go about it is to just learn off people and then improve it that way. There's just so many things you don't spot when you're developing solo, which is why it's probably better to work in a team. Um, so I'll show you some gameplay here. This is the main menu in the garage. Um, so you can go through, you can select your cars, you've got your stat screen, info screen, whatever. So again, all these cars are they're very unique. They have their own interiors and special abilities you can use within a race or whatever to take out opponents. Um, license plate, um, change it to Sussex real quick, um, just for a fitting theme. Um, I'll skip ahead to gameplay. Quite loud, sorry about that. Um, there you go. Uh, let me find a good starting point. There we go. So it's the start of a race, you get put in uh, automatically in a first person view so you can look around inside the cockpit and everything. Um, and one of the things I focused on was the driving experience to make the, the world feel alive. I, I used immersion as a tool to enable that. So um, the player can you know look around the cockpit, they can go uh, third person, first person, or if they want there's a, an option for a hood camera. Um, so as you can see that the cockpit there, there was abilities and you could see where your stats for your car. And in third person, you've got more clear layout. So first person is, isn't as practical, but if you really want to feel grounded in the world, that would be the way to go. And I think players like that balance, at least that's the community. Um, so there's been, there's been a good amount of work done to this physicalized model of the driving. Um, so there's like a gear changing system. In the bottom right there, you see that um, kind of H looking thing. That's uh, one, two, three, four, uh, first, second, third, fourth gears. And the player can choose between those gears and whatever they like. Um, this makes it a more interactive experience in the in the racing genre because it's not really a game. I don't think that's like like this before. It took some time to get balanced, but um, that was one of the major selling points of the game. People found that um, it is more breaking into like the simulation racing market. It's quite niche, um, but all these people love to spend you know thousands of pounds of uh, their money on on simulation rigs and stuff. So this is the way to break into kind of a budget market in that regard, where you can still change gears, but it's more, you know, it's more casual, it's more arcade, you don't need to worry about, um, you know, spending God knows how much on hardware. Um, but it's basically, it's basically like that. It's, it, it, it's, um, it basically allows people to play it and not have to worry about spending loads. And that has sold, I think, helped sell at least like 50% more copies because of it. Uh, even if people don't care for the aesthetic, it's still something they can play around with and have fun with. Um, and there is a demo they can try before they buy the game. So if they like that, then they can, um, then they can buy the game. And that has worked very effectively, um, very effectively. Um, and again, as I've been progressing in patching the game, it's still kind of added up and has paid off in the end. Those people now are saying, you know, oh, good job on the updates, um, which is it's, it's all good, my ego, but um, it, it's. It's still, you still got, you still always stuff to learn. You see what I mean? Like, um, there's always going to be things you can improve on, um, and I think that's again quite valuable to take away that you can always be better next time. Um, but yeah, generally that is the projects. Um, the rest of this video is just gameplay like that, so don't worry about missing anything. And I think that's just about ten minutes. So thank you very much. Any questions? So stunning project. I just wanted to say we've got one of the um, like visually so impressive, um, yeah. particularly. Um, but uh, we've got a question uh, from the chat um, from Chloe Yuen. Um, how did you do the AI for the other vehicles? Ask your question. Actually, yeah, sorry, I should have included that. Um, so the AI was a pretty major point that was using a Python library called TensorFlow into the project. 
um, using Unity's ML agents, which is um, machine learning based. So you set the vehicles on a track, um, you tell them to hit this checkpoint in a certain amount of time, and then it penalizes or rewards itself depending on how far it gets or how close along the track it gets. Um, it shoots out ray casts um, to, to kind of see the like uh, beams. This is how I think at least early Tesla AI worked. Um, where they they shoot out beams like radar beams and then they they see you know where things are but it's very obviously extremely simplified version of that um, and then it would yeah learn from that process and over time it would become to an experience where it could you know dodge cars in traffic as it's racing past and it's still a bit hit and miss and there's still things again you can refine on but it's all it's all there it's all working um, but that is the premise of it yeah super and we have, we have another question from um, from Shofi. Uh, saying a uh, really good demo and as an 80s child very apt do you consider you did uh, did you consider using vr or mobile gaming ah, yes. do this again yeah. again very good question sorry i should include this so a lot of people were asking for vr because it is again very immersive in, in that regards for the first person mode and uh, people on reddit I, I posted on reddit a few times with massive communities on there online asking about um you know is it coming to vr when's it coming to vr um so i felt inclined to and so i did and of course over two weeks without a headset <laughs> And a lot of coffee. I basically sat down and made this VR mode, and it was extremely buggy when I came out. I got some much deserved criticism for that um, because, again, having a headset would have been amazing. But um, I basically just had to borrow my mate's time when he came back from work and was like, you know, "Can you hop on and test this and make sure this is driving right? And can you smash into the barriers right without like, freaking out this time in VR?" Because a lot of the problems with that come with like you, you have like motion sickness and accessibility issues like that. There's lots of different platforms for VR, but Unity gives you um, uh, it gives you something called open VR which encompasses uh, hardware like the valve index uh, oculus Rift, and the HTC vibe which is great all in one package just plug and play uh, but if I wanted to support uh, more niche hardware like quest or uh, I don't know mixed reality headsets that it would be a, a lot tougher job but in the end yeah I, I updated it so um, it, it will work fine right yeah. I have a question, if I might. Well, I mean, again, really, actually, really visually, really interesting and impressive project there. Really, it does remind me of the old 80s outrun, which I, I remember very well. Uh, one of the interesting things about a project, all these final year projects, is that they can be a very useful calling card for students as you move on towards a professional career. And this is a good example of something that you could have in a portfolio. This would look impressive to potential employers. There's a lot of achievement in there. You speak about it very well. Seeing as you put it on Steam and obviously you've got people using that, have you actually had any feedback or, or potentially any approaches from any game houses who like what they see and see the potential in what you might be able to do um, for them? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. The plan currently is to update it here and there with leftover bugs over the coming two weeks. Um, after that, I'm gonna not abandon it, but basically just leave it and then i'll because currently i haven't put anything out there like i haven't said on linkedin or whatever i haven't put out um you know, i've done this project come and have a look at my portfolio or whatever i haven't sent out portfolios actively either so right now i think the, the priority is just um getting it done um getting a bit of rest in and then i'll head off to the industry with a you know blind portfolio behind me and actively start looking for offers and stuff like that yeah mm, very good so we've got one more question in the chat, and I think um, then perhaps we'll move on to the next one. So um, uh, Timothy has said, um, the driving model looks great on the videos. How did you go about this? I, I also, relatedly, actually, I know game studios spend a lot of time on this and can't quite get it right. So it's very impressive. Yeah. Um, so I took inspiration from Grand Theft Auto V's uh, driving model, which was obviously I can never achieve something like that solo or with my amount of knowledge. But um, there is some great um, yeah, community members out there that will help you along the way um but what essentially it does is it's just a, a, a like if you imagine an object without any friction and then you apply a force to that um like an, a, an acceleration force to that as you're driving the car um and basically you you just you just apply forces to left the right side of it uh, depending on where you're going and if you're drifting or whatever um it sounds simple but it's it's i think the final car controller code piece was over 2000 lines which was uh, a bit much again i i could have done a lot to optimize that but um yeah i wouldn't have been i wouldn't i couldn't have done anything like that without looking at examples again from like grand theft auto or other driving games uh, i tried to make it unique as well with the gear shifting and experimented around what i could do to that to influence the physics model 
Um, but in the end, it, it turned out. Uh, it turned out all right. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive, actually, Will. Um, Timothy, are you ready to present? Mm, yes. Uh, thanks for the answer, Will. Uh, um, so let me just bring my screen up then. Okay. We the meeting screen. Uh, the presentation already. Okay. Let's jump to the first one. Um, nice zoom operated. There we go. Um, it's on the wrong desktop, isn't it? You can see the presentation view. Uh, We're seeing the presenter view at the moment. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just unplugging that. Um, that should be better now. Uh, okay. So if I. Uh, yep. Here, that's working. There we go. Uh, slide. Uh, zoom. Give me one second. There we go. So that should be easier to manage now. There we go. So, uh, hi, I'm Tim, and uh, my final year project was uh, lightweight 2D physics engine uh, for desktops. And uh, to kind of introduce the project quickly, uh, it was a 2D physics uh, library uh, written in Monogame and C Sharp. So, Monogame is the framework for C Sharp uh, to kind of help develop games. Uh, but also all sorts of uh, or game book kind of oriented um, project. And so the 2D physics engine uh, to allow other developers to develop and simulate physical spaces in real time, uh, like video games uh, in two dimensions. Uh, it was only limited to rigid bodies uh, with different shapes and properties, and those properties included Mm, sorry, restitution and uh, also friction, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Mm, and those properties will then be used in a collision detection system and collision resolution system uh, to provide kind of realistic be uh, behavior between bodies, um, which would then be showed off in a full game uh, demo, kind of a very simple top down view game of pool uh, for two players with uh, simple rules and uh, just to show the features of the game. Uh, so starting off with the development and how I went about creating a project, most of it, or like a significant part of the project, uh, was research and actually uh, figuring out how uh, how does a game engine work. Uh, I've worked with games for a long time uh, before, and uh, I was kind of curious how the tools uh, that I use, like Unity or other game engines, uh, work uh, underneath. And uh, so I studied a bit of Unity's uh, even loop, but also uh, some other simpler engines like box 2 uh, And then also the physics behind collision resolution, uh, which uh, was quite important. But once I got that right, it was basically rewriting the equation into my, uh, my engine to uh, get working. Uh, so I went with Monogame uh, stack, and I started with learning the framework itself at the beginning, and then kind of developing a rendering system on the way, which you can see uh, here on the right, uh, which shows us kind of the, uh, like what the rendering library was capable of. Uh, so we'll share cool squares, uh, triangles, and polygons free. Uh, but adding that to the engine would be another step because it's easier to draw something than actually collided with other stuff. So um, then I moved on to developing engine loop, which uh, was, uh, there was a slight variation from the original design, which I had. Uh, that um, originally I planned to plug model game into my own game loop. And then after learning the framework, I realized that it's not really intended for that use. Uh, I should probably rather uh, just use model game with existing loop. But still, a lot of good learning about how game loops work and how that whole pattern, design pattern, looks like. Uh, and the collision detection uh, was the big part of the system, probably most uh, computational and like algorithmic heavy. Uh, problem I had to do with. Um, I decided to go with separating access stream for various reasons, but in 2D uh, physics, this is the best option 
uh, is the least, uh, um, yeah, the, takes the shortest time, is the fastest in 2D graphics. In 3D, it's not necessarily, uh, but in, in case of 2D graphics, that was the best option to go with. And the way the theory works is it draws axes for each of the size of two colliding bodies. Uh, and then it compares the two bodies on both axes, their max and min points. And if there is no separation between max and min points, then it means there is no separation on the axis and it carries on to the next one. And eventually, if you get through all the sides of each of the bodies and axes for that side, uh, then if you have no separation, the bodies must be colliding. Otherwise, uh, as in this case, you have separation between them on this axis, so they can't be colliding, and you can just end the um, processing them. You know, they are not colliding. And that was one of the optimizations that I went with, uh, which was kind of uh, if two bodies, we know they are not colliding, stop comparing them. We don't care, not, care about them anymore. Uh, so uh, other optimizations I did was removing also doubles. So if uh, we're comparing all the bodies in the simulation against each other, and we already compared them before, because we compared box one to box two, we don't want to be comparing box, uh, comparing box two to box one. Um, and then another step of uh, development was the collision resolution, which I mentioned before that was uh, simpler than I expected because the code of the engine was very modular at this point after designing everything carefully uh, and few iterations of um, redesign of core engine components, it was just plugging in mathematic equations in the right place uh, and using values we, uh, I got from the collision, uh, collision detection. Mm -hmm. um, then I also need to add static and collider bodies, which you can see in the full game simulation. I need them to show uh, the workings of the pocket uh, so that was collider bodies because both have, need to be able to sink into the body and then collision needs to be registered, uh, but you don't want to respond to the collision. Uh, so that was one uh, complexity there and then static bodies like the bounce and I solved that by using inverse mass. Uh, so basically their mass was kind of infinite uh, in that case. Um, and then to kind of allow other developers to prototype more easily with the tool, uh, I decided to add some colors and textures to all bodies. Uh, which you can see on the screenshot below. You can directly in the library, you can color objects, uh, add an outline to them, and also fill color, uh, which in my experience, if you have tools like that, it's way easier to prototype something than if you have to handle that processing yourself. Um, and then obviously developing a full demo, uh, full game demo, you can see, and then friction, which was a very interesting property. Uh, I read some a few papers about it and a few we got a few other examples of people uh, handling it in 2D and 3D. And the way I dealt with it was using uh, static and dynamic friction. Basically, when body is static, as you can see on the picture, uh, it wants, uh, it, it needs more force than if it's already moving the, uh, because the friction or the rough surface between two bodies kind of uh, intersects with each other. And to break that, uh, that force that's holding them, in more force than when the body is already moving and kind of sliding uh, over each other. And uh, now I'll present a demo of the engine because that will be the best way to present to you what I managed to achieve uh, in the end. Uh, and just start the full demo. Uh, just hopefully load up. I'll do two quick demos. So one will be the full game, a very simple VI that uh, I developed to uh, show off what's uh, going on. Uh, and then I'll also uh, show some stress tests on the engine, how capable it is, it is of uh, scaling up to how many bodies you can get from the simulation at the same time. Uh, so we have a simple pool table here. And if we charge our shot and the ball with the uh, cue, uh, let go of it, the bodies go around and they bounce off each other. There's friction between the bodies itself, as well as constant friction being applied to all the bodies so they come to a stop uh, eventually. And if you, I'll try to pocket the ball uh, by a third, third block pool, so that might be not the easiest uh, task. Mm, if you pocket a ball, it should disappear, uh, and it does disappear. Um, and because it detects a collision with the pocket, um, uh, then the ball disappears uh, off the table, and the rest of the rules can pretty much be handled by uh, the players of the game. It's a very simple demo, though it shows us all the features that I got in the game. There's friction between bodies um, and also possible gravity. You could put it in a different direction and have a side-scrolling game, for example. Uh, so ending this 
part of the demo. I will just move on to the video, uh, which we have here. So we have a stress test running on 500 simultaneous objects in the simulation. Uh, they're, uh, they have random forces applied to them all the time, and they, they're, in trying, you know, kind of, they're trying to uh, collide with each other. Um, and while they collide, you can see the uh, collision resolution. Um, so this kind of shows that the engine won't probably work well. It's running smooth at this point, but from test results I'll show you in a second, it wasn't the best uh, the best performing engine when it comes to scaling to like three low level particles. Like you don't try to do some precise physical simulation. Not for games, but this is, I think this is more than enough. And if someone wants to have so many bodies in the simulation, they should probably uh, look into more precise uh, physics engine. But also this could be improved on with uh, which I'll talk, in a, talk about in a second. As you can see, the bodies are colliding. And if I just skip forward a bit, and there is something more happening on the screen when they're moving uh, around. This is not happening in real time, so the recording, uh, so because I'll probably risk the zoom. Uh, zoom will just go down um, suddenly. Uh, so, yeah, that was a stress test. And if I just come back to my uh, presentation and talk more about uh, test results, but I got for um, one second. So um, while developing the product, I decided to go with um, testing approach that would be uh, to uh, put the engine to stress and also test different optimization I did on the way. And as you can see, I carried on with unit testing to make sure that everything returns the correct result that I would expect of it. Uh, and I achieved 74% uh, code coverage, which I think is a good result considering that some points were very uh, off code, were very edge cases. And in simulation, that is kind of random every time, and that is difficult to test uh, this out. Mm, so, mm, yeah, here we have some tests that I run around on the uh, fish product including a uh, vector struct. So to make sure that uh, my uh, engine is running fast, I introduced my own vector struct, uh, which uh, gave about 20% uh, performance, uh, time performance over the vector struct provided with monogame. Uh, basically, I just removed all the unnecessary info, uh, monogame uh, vector stores. And I also kind of improved on the mass. They have kind of float, uh, float of the vectors. In the engine, uh, then I made some improvements to collision detection, which was really good. Um, early term and terminating early if there is no if there is separation between bodies, and that gave about 30 to 50 uh, percent uh, change in, in a single comparison uh, between bodies. And uh, finally, I uh, did some collision resolution uh, improvements as well, uh, which were not significant, but also it was a very simple change and. Because it happens so many times a second, you can see uh, that it was actually being about 20% uh, percent, uh, time improvement uh, overall. And then uh, looking at scalability of the simulation, uh, up to 700 bodies in the simulation it was running fine. And then when I scaled it up extremely to 2,000 bodies in the simulation, that was a bit too much for this engine. Um, but this could be improved on. And uh, one of the ways would be a broad phase collision detection, which would First, compare bodies uh, with simpler shapes, uh, like uh, axis of iron bounding box, for example, where you only compare uh, squares on X and Y plane. And if they are colliding, then you check bodies. If not, there is no point of comparing to them any more precisely. Uh, precisely. Uh, then also, I'll probably extend the engine to allow more shapes, so all convex polygons, for example, or combining the shapes together to create like half circles with uh, squares combined together. Um, that could be an interesting development. And adding rotation, which was something I looked up in the early research, but I decided to um, go in a different direction uh, and add uh, slightly different features to my uh, engine. Um, yeah, that was the project I worked on. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, are there any questions about this? Thank you. Um, Will has put a question in the chat. Uh, um, well, I'd say the sort of question you'd expect from a game designer, really. Do you think further resign, refinement would make this commercially viable or reliable to develop a full-fledged physics game with? 
uh, with this one, I think further development could uh, definitely get it to a point where it would be, uh, you could make a game of it. And uh, keep in mind that this is a physics library. So if you want to make a game, you still need to handle probably a lot of rendering values. Having in mind a pro uh, expansion of this project where I would probably move away from using a mono game to handle my rendering and engine needs. And I'll use OpenGL myself uh, to handle graphics rendering. And then I'll probably turn it more into a game engine itself rather than just physics simulations. Uh, but looking at examples like uh, Box2D, uh, kind of start in a similar, uh, similar uh, place of this project. And the project expanded, it grew so big that a lot of uh, mobile games are also desktop games used it. For example, Angry Birds used Box2D. And the guy who developed the engine is now head of uh, all physics, I think, at Blizzard Entertainment. So, uh, yeah, I think it could surely uh, extend it, uh, could do for a good uh, game, at least physics engine or complete game engine. Um, if no one else has got any questions, I must admit, I'm quite curious about uh, how you uh, found your time meeting deadlines and so on in the project because of course in the real world of software that's that's what people talk about most um and i'm i'm impressed that you had time to run thorough tests and also to refine your original project i mean did you find that uh, it took less time or more time and how did you plan your time because I, I, oh. I think as a, if you're going to show this as a portfolio you could maybe uh, mention your own time management rather more than you have done on this conclusion slide, because that that's what people in the software industry are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I have some ex professional experience using Agile, and that was something I kind of I skipped it in the presentation because I thought I should focus more on the uh, project part, uh, not really how I manage it. But oh. uh, so I have some professional experience with Agile, and I saw some really unnecessary things. In the process, obviously, Agile is not equal at every company, and companies do differently uh, depending on the methodology they go with. Uh, but they use Scrum, and I kind of saw like there were so many meetings that we spent just refining uh, details of something for hours, and that really didn't contribute to anything actually being done because those details were later changed anyway during the development because we found something new. Uh, and so those meetings were pointless. The way I went about it was uh, I decided to drop all meetings, obviously, because that was just myself. Uh, but I did have meetings with my product supervisor, uh, King Lee, which I'm really grateful for the guidance on this project and also all the help with uh, the problems that I might have looked back on, on the way. Uh, but um, yes, I kind of adjusted Agile and I went with this approach of where I would design a part, uh, kind of get something working, and then come back. Uh, to my original design and refine it based on uh, what I've learned on the way. So, for example, the mono game uh, learning part mm, in the I looked up the game loop and I saw, oh, my design, original design from what I developed, uh, it won't work that well, uh, yeah, that well as I expected it to. So, I went back, uh, made some changes to the core design and went back to developing. So, and then when you do that, you kind of find out that the further you go away, the less changes the core of the product you make. And uh, at the beginning of the project, there were still some changes going into the core, but when, once I got to that collision detect, uh, detection part, collision resolution, there weren't many changes to the core anymore. It was mostly, uh, mostly if any changes, just to the structure of those parts and not the core of the engine. Thank you. Um, shall we? Sorry, uh, are you ready to go on? Or has someone got another question? Sorry. Sorry, Blake, could I just uh, butt in and ask a very, very quick question? Sure, sure. So, so physics, of course, uh, is, is a very useful thing and, and is needed for, for a lot of computer games. Do you think that there's space in, uh, or there should be uh, space made in our uh, curriculum to teach a little bit of physics for mm, computer I think games? that would be a great idea. Um, I think that would be very beneficial to computer science students, maybe not in very, uh, very in-depth level, uh, but I was, I was just thinking about it that usually when you finish an engineering uh, degree, uh, you might be more suited, better suited for some even programming jobs when you teach yourself programming 
and you have the very technical physics knowledge uh, than you would be if you finish a computer science degree and you have absolutely no engineering knowledge whatsoever uh, because there are just so many jobs that require you to be a programmer but also an engineer. Uh, so that would definitely allow uh, computer science to for students to go into areas like, uh, for example, physics uh, or game engine development, which uh, I'm, I know of the companies who develop them, they usually test you first on physics and how good you are with that before they even ask you about any programming uh, experience or uh, abilities because they are more interested in how, uh, how will you be able to handle that, uh, that programming itself. So uh, yeah, I think that would be very beneficial to have at least a module uh, per, uh, per degree. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Anson, are you ready to present for us? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, just trying to mess with that. Yep. Can you see the slides? Yes, that's fine. So yeah, uh, my name is Anson, and today I'll be talking about my final year project, uh, Master of Arms 2.0. Yeah, there you go. So in this presentation, I'll be covering these following topics, starting with a brief explanation of what Master of Arms was and an overview of what I've done to improve it throughout the year. Then I'll show some gameplay. And then lastly, I'll finish off with some functional functionality breakdowns, mostly covering the enemy system overhaul. So what is Master of Arms? It's a roguelike first-person first looter shooter with that's a fast-paced shooter with random weapon generation that can create more than 2,000 unique weapons. Uh, the first version was developed for the game design development group coursework from last year and was developed by me and my team of friends. So here is a gameplay of the original version. So in it, I, we have some basic uh, movement with a double jump and a double dash. And right now I'm using a shotgun and this is the like, uh, final level of the game. So right now I'm just shooting at different enemies, including some boss. Yeah. So yeah, right now I'm just going around killing enemies and stuff. So, yeah. So as for the project itself, my goal is to basically improve upon it by myself by adding in more features and also cleaning up the code base and refactoring a lot of old systems. So over the year, I've managed to accomplish these following tasks, including ref uh, refactoring the camera uh, control system, adding in a hand, uh, adding in new weapon animation, refactoring the weapon system and handling, Overhauling the player movement and kit by giving the player stick onto walls, bouncing off them, sliding, crouching, and melee. I've also implemented a shot data and perk system with 15 weapon perks implemented. I also added a random cover generation to the levels. And I've also overhauled the enemy system, which include giving them a patrol point system, redoing the enemy AI, and also implementing the enemy spawn system. And on top of that, I perform a lot of visual and environmental polish and also lots of general improvements and refactoring. So here's a clip of me playing through the game again in the final level. So right now I'm using a... This is too loud. Too loud. So right now I'm using a... Uh, golden AK weapon. It has a special perk where if four shots are close to each other, it will create a point where the player can shoot at to explode. So yeah, right now I just use my new melee ability, which damage enemies in front of me. And now I swap to a new gun I've added into the game, which is called the wrist gun. It's a fast firing shotgun and it carries two perks. One of them being called heating up, 
where every kill with a weapon increases the weapon's fire rate. So you can see the perk activating with the eye, blue icons coming up. Its second perk is called Reward and Encouragement. It, what it does is that if the player manages to land more than half the magazine, the weapon will increase its damage. If the player couldn't do that, it will increase the weapon's accuracy instead as encouragement. So next I have the uh, final stand, which was shown in both the earlier gameplay and right here as well. But the difference is that I, it has the iron grip perk where the weapon's accuracy will remain the same. So in this weapon's case, it will remain 100% accurate. So, so it seems like I've killed sufficient amount for, su sufficient enough, su uh, I killed enough enemies where the next wave of Enemies have spawned, which include a new enemy type, which is the flying enemy drones. So those white flying stuff, those are the flying enemies. And right now I'm trying to uh, shoot at the boss's head, which causes it to stagger, as you can see here, which is a new system I've added in, where it will cause the enemy to kneel down and be vulnerable to damage. So yeah. Yeah, that's me using the melee again. So right now, I believe I'm trying to set up another point explosion with my AK. So that creates a area damage, which staggers and do damage to all the enemy around it, which helps me dispatch of those black enemies very quickly. So right now I'm also using the new movement kit, which is taking off the walls and bouncing off them to get back onto the ledge. So right now I'm, yeah, I tried to set up another point explosion, but it didn't work as the enemies were too far or not lying inside with the explosion. And now I'm left with the final boss now. I'm trying to finish it off. Yeah. And here I also use a new kit I've added, which is crouching down, which allows me to take cover and dodge the enemy's attack. And yeah, that allows me to take up the boss quite easily. So next I'll be covering some functionality breakdowns. And due to time constraint, I'll mostly be covering the uh, enemy system and more particularly the enemy AI. So on the system. So as for the overall itself, I have mostly focused on implementing a patrol system, which marks which position the AI can take cover from and its relative information. I've also moved the AI's operation to follow a more finite state machine behavior. I have overhauled what the AI can do and how they do them. And lastly, I've changed the spawning system to allow the enemy to spawn in ways instead. So the reason for the overhaul is that the original AI's behavior was controlled by mostly the nested if statements and Boolean and states being monitored by Booleans. And on top of that, the AI doesn't use any AI superclass at all. So we have to copy and paste the code for each enemy type. So I'm gonna say the code itself is just pure spaghetti, and it I would say it's definitely worse than that ball spaghetti in the image below. So yeah, so the AI, the original AI behavior is very simple, uh, but it works though at a cost of it being not fun to shoot at and being very dull very quickly. So with the new uh, finite state machine approach, it migrates the original AI to follow more finite state machine kind of behavior where this uh, improved fixed intelligence AI framework 
I have used for many different projects for the AI. So what it does is that it will operate differently depending on what state it's in. So for this AI, it will have five states. It has the idle state where it does nothing. You have the move state where it process and pick a destination and move towards it. It has the attack state where it'll pick a suitable attack and then be ex executed. Next, it'll have a stack state where it, op it will stop its operation for duration and become vulnerable. And then lastly, it will have a death state where that's when the AI dies. So its whole operation is illustrated very uh, simple finite state machine in the simplified finite state machine graph. But what it essentially does is that the AI will start in the idle state. It will try to find a valid attack. If it doesn't find a valid attack, it will then go into the move state to then move and reposition. And at any stage, the AI can be staggered by the player if their weak points been hit too many times. And then lastly, it will also move to the death state if it does, if its health reaches zero. So now as to operating for each state, each state essentially follows this kind of state framework where it has a kind of change state uh, method, an AI think, AI behavior, and end state. So what the change state does is when the AI moves to a new state, that will then execute the code within the change state. You have the AI behavior, which is reserved for code that needs to be executed every frame. So for more lighter operations, then you have the uh, AI think where it's reserved for more heavy operation where the code needs to be executed constantly, but in a set interval, like half a second, for example. So this allows me to optimize the AI to then avoid heavy operation using up too many resource by firing up too many times more than it needs to. And then lastly, I have an end state where it will then clean up what the state is doing before moving to a new state. So on top of that, I've also implemented a kind of attribute system to AI where I can customize an AI and influence its behavior based on its attributes. So for example, if I assign AI with a offensive attribute, it will prioritize picking positions where it moves towards the player. If the AI have defensive attributes, it will then maintain its distance to the player instead and just move in around the player in an arc. And lastly, I have the attack behind cover attribute where I'll prioritize picking destinations that are behind cover. So another benefit with this system is that I can mix attributes together. So if it's combined with a defensive attribute, the AI will then prioritize taking cover and also finding cover that's further away from the target in order to maintain that distance. <coughs> So here's a video of the AI in motion. So on the left side, it's my scene view. And on the bottom right is what I see on the player's side. So right now I started off with the AI already in cover. Once I move around it and compromise its cover, the AI will realize it's compromised. It'll then find a further cover behind it and then go around it to take cover while attacking. <coughs> I compromise it again, it then moves to the opposite side of the cover. As a demon, it's far enough, but it's cover. I compromise it again, it then moves to a further cover and attack me from behind it. Oh, yeah. That's essentially the AI. So in conclusion, I have implemented way a lot of new features into the game. I've done multiple play tests and all the plays find it to be a lot more enjoyable compared to the older version. So I must say my project is a success. Any questions? I'll chip in if I might. Hello, Anson. Hello. Um, one of the interesting things about using quite a few students, I think, who are doing game projects saw the advantages of the finite state machine approach for yep. controlling AI characters. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things about it is a it gets rid of your bowl of spaghetti, so we can we can put the spaghetti in the bin where it belongs. Yep. <laughs> but b it actually provides a way of modifying the behavior in a really sensible way at runtime, mm -hmm. so you can actually have adaptive behaviors and control them in a, a sort of a really interesting way. 
did you have any kind of ideas about how the sort of the, the AIs would kind of evolve or adapt their behavior? And because could indeed they could do that in response to the way the player themselves is playing. So you can have a very responsive game experience. Mm -hmm. So the AIs can become more aggressive if you can measure a level of aggression from the player. And you can do some really cool game stuff. I mean, do you, yeah. is, that, is that part of what you were thinking of trying to achieve? Uh, I haven't thought about it because I want to keep it simple because I want to make sure the ad does what I need it to do. Because I, at the end of the day, I am set essentially what it does, what it needs to do is to set a challenge to the player. So I, that itself, I need to be fine tuning it manually most of the time, but making it adaptive can also be another challenge I can implement into, but it does run the risk of doing things it's not meant to be doing. But yeah, mm. that'd be something it's I will look at. Okay, cool. Just a thought. Yeah. Thank you. The cover system. Thank you, Anson. If there's no more oh. questions, uh, oh, wait a minute. A there's, there's one question. in the chat. Uh, how did you handle the covers system? Did you have to mark them manually? for the AI parts map, or would the AI detect the tall objects as covers itself? Uh, so how I mark the covers that, uh, first off, Unity has its own pathfinding algorithm with NavMesh and NavMesh agent. So all I have to do is to set the enemy or the AI to have NavMesh agent. I can pass a point in the world that's on a nav mesh, nav mesh and they'll just move towards it. Now as for detecting the cover, I basically have a system where I put a collider in the world in my level. It'll then automatically detect uh, where a cover lies. So I'm trying to put up Unity so it's a lot easier to explain. But it's yeah, so it kind of detects and saves which point is a um, which point is a cover point and also the direction from that point to the cover. So that also allows me to then calculate if the AI's if the AI's cover is compromised at a player by doing some uh, dot products. Oh. So if I change my share screen to uh, screen one. Yes. Can you see my Unity? Yes. Yeah. So this is exactly what I used. So that is a kind of box where I kind of put multiple of them in a level. And then if I show the... the drag off. Oh, it's being funny. Uh, uh, it's being funny. Oh, I'll give up. <laughs> don't don't yeah, worry. Dem demonstration yeah. failure has been with us since the beginning of the <laughs> software industry. Um, yeah. I, I think it's... you've explained how you did it. Um, yeah. Uh, Chloe asked, how does the hand animation fit onto all those different guns? So that's based on the uh, can controller system I've implemented. So what I have done is, let me pull out a gun model, perhaps. Easier to... No. So here, for example, is a model of the a M9 pistol. So how I animate it is that I have these kind of green hand points where it basically saves an animation, its position and rotation. And then I have a controller where it'll then feed in points where the hand should be following. So let's call it M6. So here's a better one. So for example, in this 
M16, I have a reload animation, which does, uh, which does this. But what it's do is that I put in a animation event where it'll then pass in a new pointer where the hand will then lerp to that set new green hand and then we'll follow the position of the green hand, like that magazine. And then once I want to change to a new position, it'll then move out past in a new point. So in that case, I'll pass the point number index two. Now as for it uh, handling different positions, since basically the weapons are randomly put together, the position where the resting hand, resting left hand is changes. So that follows the same kind of system where I have a main hand on the player and it will receive a new position of where the hand should be lurping and moving towards. And yeah, that's kind of how I've done it. Yeah, thanks, Anson. Chloe, can, uh, can I ask you if you're ready now? Yes, uh, I'm ready. I will start uh, presenting, hopefully. Um, oh, it just lost us. Share screen. Let's pop two. Okay, can you uh, hopefully see it? That's great. Awesome. Okay, so mine's very different from everyone else. I did a human computer interaction project. Uh, so mine is called designing in car user interfaces for level three autonomous vehicles to increase safety in the needs of van dwellers. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically I'm creating a heads up display for uh, people who travel and live in vans and uh, hopefully make it a bit safer for them. And I'll also be looking into designing for a vehicle that is self-driving. I also want to quickly credit my supervisor, Dimitri, for helping me along the way. Um, so, yeah, there we go. So um, I'll, I can split this up into uh, four main areas. The, the needs of uh, van dwellers, so finding the requirements out for them. Uh, understanding the scope of safety, as there are many hazards in the world that can kill you and hurt you. So we must narrow down these to situations uh, a van dweller uh, will find themselves in. Uh, then we'll also be looking into uh, well, automotive interface design and, des and the impact uh, a level three uh, self uh, autonomous vehicle will have on uh, the design. Uh, so yeah, this was also quite like an indulgent project to be working on uh, van dwellers because it's something that uh, I hope maybe I can do in the future is go on a little traveling trip in a van. Um, but yeah, so further on with my project, uh, it was a very kind of uh, research project. So I started with like a literature review and it's some primary research. Um, where I, I interviewed um, interviewed van dwellers. Uh, I did a user study, so I created some low fidelity prototypes, uh, did some work um, creating layouts in Adobe XD and also creating a simulation in uh, Unity. And then obviously I came up with some results. So, um, the literature review, I, there's limited research on van, van dwellers. So that is why I did some uh, primary user research. Uh, I also um, read a whole bunch of papers on uh, automotive UI design as that's the, the foundation of what I'm doing. I looked into automated vehicles, uh, heads up displays, um, and mainly focusing on windshield displays because that's the type I've decided for, uh, and the, as a windshield display, display it would be uh, augmented reality. So I also looked at also, uh, augmented reality within uh, the automotive UI design space. So the primary user research, my favorite part, because I got to talk to a whole lot of people and, I'm, and they had very interesting stories. Uh, so yeah, our questions were split into four areas. Um, I did it about the, uh, the finding the demographics about them themselves, understanding um, uh, 
what they're like traveling and living in the vehicle, uh, digital devices they use, and also um, about safety because the focus is designing for safety. Um, so, and this was obviously optional uh, because safety could be a bit of a question one if they've had uh, a uh, you know bad experience maybe. Uh, so this was the results of my uh, research. Uh, I think I, we should particularly focus uh, due time with the primary user research. So what I found uh, that there were three main um, focus points that uh, affected uh, a, a van dweller uh, in terms of safety. Uh, this was finding a place to, to park at night. One, um, one participant had a crazy story where in the middle of the night in Europe, uh, a guy holding a weapon was like shaking the van, uh, which seems pretty scary. So uh, her partner climbed into the, um, the driver's seat and just like drove off, uh, getting the hell out of there. Uh, the next two was uh, what one, the most popular one was driving up mountains uh, along edges, could be quite sketchy. Um, uh, some, uh, someone had to try and uh, reverse down a mountain in a snowstorm, uh, and her partner was outside um, trying to uh, help, help them navigate uh, down this road. Uh, and also, driving under and over bridges. Uh, there were, they said some had a, there were some incidents where the, the top of their, their vehicle got a bit uh, uh, damaged as well and they were slightly unsure with some bridges. Uh, so that was the research from my um, results from my research. Uh, so the scope of safety uh, turns out the safety is a huge uh, topic. Uh, as I said before, there are many, different types of hazards uh, and stuff. So this was a really um, great uh, categorization uh, by this paper that helped me determine uh, what, what I'm focusing on. So I decided to focus on spatial awareness. So this was understanding the dimensions of the vehicle uh, with the dimension, uh, with, uh, with the environment and understanding that um, uh, as, determined by the primary user research, this was uh, quite important uh, for them. Uh, next, we have the um, autonomous vehicles. So initially, this was a big part, but we, uh, we needed to understand the foundations of it. Uh, so the different levels of automation, if you don't know, uh, we are focusing on uh, level three automation, um, which is, uh, it means the system can drive but you have to be ready for takeover is when you, you, you would be needed to start driving. Uh, so we want to understand the impact of uh, an automated uh, vehicle has on uh, the design of uh, a windshield display. Uh, so there were like uh, two uh, elements that were highlighted I think uh, for level three vehicles uh, that were uh, in relation to safety. And this was uh, takeovers and trust. So as I said, takeovers when the, uh, the, the driver needs to start driving. Uh, so this can be like a, a safety uh, situation, but by informing the driver of the context, understanding their spatial awareness, uh, being able to highlight obstacles that they would face, they could help uh, adapt them to the environment quicker during uh, a takeover. Um, and also it will help build trust uh, uh, the, it will help build trust between the driver and the vehicle uh, because hesitation uh, to adopt like autonomous vehicles is because the user doesn't feel in control or doesn't understand the decision the vehicle uh, is having. So by informing the user of its vision and what's happening on the road, it can help build trust between the driver and the vehicle. And this is what uh, a, wind, a windshield display could do. Okay, so uh, this was also uh, taken from the same paper, which was super uh, useful. Uh, this helps um, understand that the considerations uh, for a use case. So uh, we were doing spatial awareness and I wanted to design uh, uh, particular user elements. So I focused on creating a UI element um, uh, 
uh, considering the, the registration of an element on a windshield. So uh, this means, is it, uh, uh, it, does it look like it's attached to the environment? It's 3D registered. Uh, so it looks like it's actually part of the environment or uh, unregistered would it's just like uh, in your face, it's not connected to the environment um, at all. And then I also focused on uh, presentation. So that was, um, if it was more uh, a symbolic abstract type of icon or maybe uh, something more naturalistic, such as an actual um, thing on the road, like a fence or a, 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 fake, a digital signpost to tell you where you're going, for example. So I created some uh, ideas uh, and uh, drawings and then I did my user study. So I built uh, a simulation in Unity. I created a, a, a little van. My vehicle is not, a, not as cool as um, Will's like DeLorean sort of cars, but it's, uh, it helps with my simulation. So the user had to go through each of the scenario with a different UI element uh, and try it out. And then they would have to fill in a user experience questionnaire and a NASA task load uh, questionnaire. I also uh, wanted to get some quantitative data. So I logged when they were on the edge of the road, when they hit something, how long it took uh, between the start and uh, the end. So my results was that uh, participants preferred um, one of uh, a 3D uh, element for a particular scenario, which was the mountain that uh, we had. Oh, I had two scenarios, the mountain one and going under a bridge. So in this mountain one, uh, it might be quite small, but the Bullard's one here was preferred um, because uh, I, I, well, we think it's because that it uh, resembled real life objects. It, it took less cognitive load than some other types of UI elements because I was in the same line of sight and easier to uh, understand. Uh, next was uh, uh, quite an interesting one where uh, text uh, was actually more preferred sometimes to the symbols. Uh, and this was kind of uh, in contrast to what papers would say. Uh, but um, I think my understanding of this was because some of the my more symbolic UI elements was maybe a bit uh, too complex, which created uh, you know, um, difficulty uh, in understanding and made it more stressful and more cognitive load. Uh, so this is something to, to, to further research. And yes, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I feel like I just spurted everything out. So hopefully you've had this, you've took something away from this. Um, there's a question in the chat from Meg. How did you find people to participate in your study? Are there lots of van dwellers around Brighton? <laughs> so you you would think that um, that these people would be left alone. They're, they're on a van and they, they've travelled into faraway places to not be, uh, you know, uh, wanting to be uh, connected with. But I. Uh, I, I love rock climbing and I know there are people who uh, also uh, like to travel in vans in, uh, in that area. So I was able to contact uh, lots of um, uh, climbing spaces on, on Facebook and also Facebook community pages for van life, uh, hashtag van life, which is a, a common uh, way of expressing your love for uh, van dwelling. So that is how I found band brothers. But good question, because at the start, it was a bit difficult. Um, there's, a, there's a long comment here. Oh, no. Um, from, <laughs> oh. From, from Hannah. Um, I... <laughs> The question yeah, there's, before there's, there's, there's something I really want to say, actually, to Chloe, which is you described this as a, a, a personal self-indulgent project. But if I, I have to say it ticks almost every box for getting a job in the <laughs> industry. Um, 
I mean, I, I guess maybe van dwellers aren't a major market, but this is a current area of research. Yeah. Primary user, user research is, it, is something that it, it's hard to recruit people with experience of it. I mean, in, in terms of employability, it, it's a wonderful project. Uh, and, and I, I, I just have to reflect that to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I really love doing my project, especially the primary user research. I love just talking to people and understanding why they've, uh, they've decided to go that path and understanding the experience they've had from that. I, I think I talked over Ian. You've got a question, Ian? No, I was just saying that before uh, Hannah's question, uh, Will had a question, which is, have you thought about hardware implementation for your design? Um, so there was um, there was papers regarding hardware implementation. Um, I decided to uh, not go down that path uh, because I wanted to focus on the design as this is a human computer uh, interaction project. Um, currently, though, there is um, there's not many wind, windshield displays out there, but things like, uh, I know Volkswagen has created uh, some sort of uh, AR displays that help the, the user also understand the environment and stuff, uh, with like a light bar, which is a very interesting uh, piece of technology that I think is uh, a, a really good uh, invention that they've decided for. Um, and yeah, I, I really uh, hope to see it more in the in the future but yeah it, it's still a long way till maybe something uh as i guess sophisticated as some of these ui elements i've created so, has anybody got any more questions um i mean that's all the presentations on my list um well can i can I say, before everyone goes, can I say our next meeting will be on September the 14th. It will be a hybrid meeting. So we'll be in Jubilee 144 on the campus and on Zoom as well. And it will be uh, <coughs> Professor Hensiger, Winfried Hensiger, who's head of the quantum computing group at the University of Sussex, who will be presenting on quantum computing. And uh, yeah, I... I would, well, I, I'd certainly like to see you. Um, and can I once again urge the, the BCS prize winners to use uh, their BCS membership, at least to trawl around the site and find contacts in the industry, because everything I've heard tonight indicates people who will be very much in demand um, uh, in this country, in the industry right now. Uh, and well, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Well done. And perhaps we'd all like to congratulate. <laughs> Good. Uh, could I just add a, a quick word to the end of what Blaze got to say has to say, which is to thank everybody for for their presentations. It's great to see that. So congratulations to you all. And I hope to see you all uh, next week at graduation uh, as well. So uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, and catching up with you at Ben's. Yeah, can I just own. ask, uh, um, I noticed that this is recorded. Is it possible to get a recording uh, from this? Uh, you want us to send you a recording? Is, is it possible? Yeah. yeah. I, missed Meg, I missed Megan's presentation a little bit of Will's, but I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to second Mark Will's project. So I, I know. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, BCS will have the recording, but I will get it. If, if you email me, I'm, okay. I'm Blay Whitby. Uh, pretty easy to find online or blay w at sussex.ac.uk i can get it, one to you it may be the case just picking up on something hannah was just saying that it may be that people who are going to be finalists people who are moving into their final year might find some inspiration or ideas from things oh, that they've seen what a great idea kingsley yeah <laughs> I, I i think yes i'd, I'd like to think that uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I know we had issues getting the BCS Eventbrite pages launched, um, but it has an option that you can send around an email to everyone who like signed up for the event. So if possible, you could always attach this recording to like an email that gets sent around to the participants. Okay. Okay.
I'll I'll make a note to do that. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, yeah, for the link. Well, if um, if I may, I'll say good night to everyone and thanks once again for some very interesting presentations. <laughs>